Hello and welcome to Deep Green Productions. Today we're talking with Mr. Steve St. Angelo. Steve is with srsrockoreports.com. Steve, welcome to the program. Yeah, hey, Dick, it's good to be here. A lot of interesting things going on in the market, so it's, uh, it's a pleasure uh, finally getting to time to chat with you. Well, Steve, it's a real treat for me, too, because I'm curious about what's happened to peak oil. Not many people are talking about it anymore, and uh, everybody seems to have bought into the story that fracking is going to turn the U.S. back into an oil exporter. But it seems to me at the same time that uh, fracking, the fracking boom is uh, an entirely contrived situation. It's all being kept afloat by the, by the U.S. government. Colin Campbell and uh, Ken DeFay said we would probably peak in 2005 in conventional, and conventional is known as cheap oil. Well, we did. Well, what happened? The price of oil started to move up. And uh, what that allowed was it, it allowed this expensive unconventional to come on. And I also believe the Fed, by propping up the, con the economy along with the other central banks, um, it allowed us to extract this very expensive oil. If the uh, central banks did not, if we did just allow the system, as the Aust Austrian school says, just allow the system to reset itself, if we let the banks go bankrupt, if we let the system reset, I don't believe we would have been able to extract that shale oil. It's just too expensive. So when the Fed came in and propped everything up, uh, it, it gave us a few more years to uh, enjoy that. So cheap oil is gone. Well, and in addition to peak oil being a phony market, there are even more fundamental problems. Um, we had the chance to catch up with Richard Heinberg when he was here in 2012 in Auckland giving a lecture. And one of the points that he makes is that when you look at a company balance sheet, energy costs might be 20% of the total cost of production, but it really doesn't describe the role of energy in that production process. Oh, yeah. Uh yeah, Richard Heinberg, or Heinberg does a great job. I've been reading a lot of his work, as, as well as David Hughes. He's, he's also at the Post Carbon Institute now. Uh, I use that example all the time because when people say, well, you know, a, a, an ounce of gold, uh, energy cost to produce, produce an ounce of gold, their, their energy uh, is only about 25, 30% of their bottom line. But I said, well, so that's not all their bottom line. You've got labor. And that's energy. It's human labor, uh, and management. Uh, and management is just high-skilled labor. And then, well, we you've got the capital. Uh, you've got the materials, the lime, the cyanide, the grinding agents. Well, they just that just shows up as a uh, expense. It shows up as a uh, goods expense on on their balance sheet. Well, it the, the value of that that grinding agent. Is came from its energy in all steps and in all forms. Uh, the same with that haul truck. Uh, some of these haul trucks are five million dollars, and uh, they move like 400 tons of, of ore at a time. Well, if you take that haul truck and you take it back to the process of manufacturing, mining, transportation, manufacturing, getting that haul truck to the mine, I would say 90 to 95 percent of the value of that truck comes from energy. So I totally agree. Uh, probably 90% or more, 95% of energy is the value of most goods and services. Well, in addition to the way many analysts miss the boat when it comes to the value of energy, they also seem to miss the real cost to production. There are many costly aspects to the modern production process, that simply don't get counted as a cost to the producer, like pollution or health impact. So those costs have to get picked up by the public. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, there's this website called Energy Policy Forum, and uh, uh, they discuss that. It's like the shale revolution. Well, uh, you should see the, the, uh, the states in Texas I believe their, uh, their budget now, because of all the road damage, every shale well needs a fleet of trucks, a fleet. And that does huge damage on the roads, especially these, these country county roads. So 
while I believe, and this is on the top of my head, they received about a billion dollars in uh, uh, state revenue from the shale industry over a period of time. The cost to repair the roads is five billion. So there you go. Uh, the price of shale oil that we're getting, even though it's expensive at $100, it's not including all the damage it's doing to the infrastructure, not including the air and the water and, and the local environment. So you, I, I totally agree with you. Well, that being the case, I guess we should look forward to an economic collapse because of the benefit to the environment. I, I agree. Um, uh, I'm one of the few precious metal analysts that uh, actually uh, I do think that there's climate change and there's serious environmental aspects because, I mean, mining, even mining gold and silver, even though I look at them and spend a lot of time uh, analyzing and researching uh, that market, uh, it's horrible. Um, uh, silver less horrible than gold because you're moving a lot less dirt and you just you're disrupting the environment in a much less proportion because the average go uh, silver miners are still mining about uh, eight ounces per ton. Uh, the top ones are, but the top gold miners it's 1.2 gram per ton. It is you're moving so much dirt and you're making so much of a mess to produce that gold. So. Yeah, I think uh, the downside of, of, a, of a smaller footprint on, on this planet is probably a positive thing for everybody, even the, the environment the, and the uh, animal kingdom, plant kingdom. Do you have any sense of where the society might revert to? Would it be the 1800s, for example, or would it be back to the Stone Age, or how far back? Well, Dimitri Olaf. Uh, he had a pretty good uh, book. It was uh, basically he had a he reinventing collapse, and he compared the, the collapse of the Soviet Union to the United States. And uh, then he had the five stages of collapse. And uh, uh, he basically said how we would go through these five stages. And we might uh, the Soviet Union, I think, went through three stages. They didn't reach the the last one, which is kind of like Mad Max. I mean, you the breakdown of society, uh, but um, you have political and you have economic and commercial collapse, and and then you've got you've got the, just the shutdown of the system. Uh, I see the U.S. I see the U.S. I don't know how it's going to fall apart, but it will, because we uh, we cheap energy brought us together as a country, and expensive energy will tear us apart. So I believe we will we will disintegrate just like the Soviet Union did into regions, and I believe uh, the regions that have the most population will struggle the, the most, like the Northeast. I think they will struggle the most. Uh, of course, the Southwest, if we have uh, a continued drought, I think that could be a problem. But I do see a reversion. I still see technology in some in some form or fashion. I still see the use of technology, maybe kind of uh, 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 putting it together in a uh, just getting old pieces and parts uh, and put, using them as best you can. Uh, but I still see some kind of technology as we disintegrate, and I do see a lot more uh, farming, a lot more people moving to farming and. I hate to tell you, if you look at a, if you put a, ch uh, a chart over the last 2,000 years, and you, you look at the population of the, the world and uh, of metals and, and and oil production, it all moves up very. It's basically flat to the 1700s, and it goes exponential. And so, I think with the fall of oil production, and it could be it could be rapid. I think you're going to see a very huge decrease in the population. Now, how that unfolds, I don't. You know, I, it's it's something that's hard to talk about, but I, I think we could lose a lot of people very quickly. It could turn out to be pretty ugly. Um, one of the things that Dmitry Orlov mentioned as a benefit to the Soviet people was the fact that uh, they had uh, that they were quite used to being self-sufficient. They were used to uh, growing their own food. They were very family-oriented. Uh, that all the, the many generations of a family might live together in in uh, one location. And that, that, to a large extent, was what enabled them to carry forward the, their whole society. Whereas with the United States, we've been so fragmented and, and uh, disassociated from each other that it's going to be a bit harder. 
Yeah, I agree. I he did say that, and it's it's true. Uh, you know, Russia Russia is very interesting because they produce about 10 million barrels of oil a day, and they only consume about three and a half, uh, about three and a half, four tops. So they're exporting the rest. Well, what are we doing? Uh, we consume 19 million barrels a day. We produce now. We're producing a little more than nine. But in 2005, we're, we're producing about 5 million and, and importing about 14. So we're living uh, on a credit card of oil. Uh, the Soviet Union can afford to uh, go on for quite a while because they have all this oil there. But our system, our system, our very complex system, I don't know how people are going to leave the suburbs and go back to the country. I, I just uh, I find it very difficult. Uh, I could see it happening like in Russia during the night, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed. But I don't know how that's going to happen here in, in the States. Uh, I, and then what happens to all that stuff that we're still building, still building strip malls, still building more commercial buildings? It, it, I mean, it's I think Houston. Has I heard it, they have 10% of all the new commercial building square footage in, in, in 2014-15 in the United States in one city. Uh, it's just amazing to me. Well, there are times when it feels like it's been planned, but certainly if it has been planned, some parts of it have been planned pretty badly. Yeah, I think if when people get back to living more local lifestyles. Uh, uh, humans are interesting people. They they conspire. They consp if there's a, a benefit to certain people who look at life a certain way, then they'll conspire with other people to benefit both of them or a group. Uh, I think it will always happen. But when when you're busy trying to maintain your life uh, on you know a, a simple life, it's much harder to to do to do foul things when you're concentrating. Hunter gatherers actually had a much higher energy return on invested lifestyle. It was 10 to 1. Uh, like simple human farming with, with just regular tools is 5 to 1. So we think we've done something better with all this technology. We haven't. The, the hunter-gatherers were actually living a much higher energy return on invested. They worked about 18, 20 hours a week. We're working 50, 60, 70 just to pay the bills. They worked 18, 20, and they had they had they didn't have to pay taxes. They had a nice lifestyle. So if you go if you think about that, we moved away from that, and we think we're a lot better. But if you look at the the the, the information, I don't think we are. Our U.S. based agricultural processing distribution system that brings food to the dinner table is a one to ten. It's the exact opposite of a hunter gatherer. It takes 10 calories of energy dumped into a system to get one calorie of corn on that dinner plate. So it, that's a huge net loser. Technology has not done anything good for us here. As a matter of fact, all the technology we've used from truckers, from uh, the farming, uh, from the processing plants to the huge supermarkets, and then all the, the cars that need to drive to the supermarkets. I mean, when you put all that together, all technology has done is devoured that the energy, and it works because we had high EROI oil to allow that net energy loser of our food production distribution system to to to, to run. And another thing, the the federal government, large institutions, and James Kunster talked about this. Large institutions need high energy return on invested to survive. So as it, as it declines, it will destroy the federal government. You see, when the Roman Empire collapsed, a lot of elite lost a lot of wealth. When you went from a million people, all those homes and businesses, the elite were making a lot of money off that. And it, it fell to 10,000 people. So it wasn't in the elite's best interest for that system to fall apart. The falling energy return on invested of the Roman Empire killed it. So the elite are going to disintegrate in a in much fashion as well as the, uh, the regular population did, the, the, just the simple, the simple worker. Uh, so I see this falling energy return on invested situation getting worse and worse. 
and I, I don't look at the, uh, I'm not afraid of the, the, uh, the NSA boogeyman. The federal government is going to you know, turn us into uh, prison planet. Right. I don't see it happening. I, 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 I don't see it happening. I see what hap- what's, what's going to happen is a, basically a disintegration of the whole system. And uh, because technology, you know, technology is very fragile. You take a, a shovel that's built with wood and steel and you throw it out of a second story house and it hits the, uh, the driveway, it'll bounce. Now take your computer and do that. It's fried. Do you know all the all the uh, servers, all these huge servers that we have on the internet, and every and all these servers that run our huge internet system, they have to be replaced every several years. How are the elite going to keep all that going? You know, they've got cameras up there. Those cameras have a life expectancy. They're not, they don't last long. The high tech doesn't last long, and the more high tech it is, the the the, the shorter its life expectancy. I mean, a good air conditioner lasts you eight years, ten years, but that's about it. You've got to buy a new one. Well, a cell phone, that thing will last you two, three years. And even though they may bring a new one out, that, that old one will stop working. It just... Planned obsolescence. That's exactly right. High tech is fragile. And so I don't see high tech ruling us because the, we won't have the, the energy to, to keep that system. There might be a, a, a little bit happening, but I don't see it controlling the, the populace. I'd like to change gears here a bit, if we can, to talk about gold and silver. What do you think will happen when the dollar collapses? Many people say it's going to happen. What will happen to gold and silver? Will they become the new money? I get two responses from when I discuss this in different uh, websites. Either A, uh, uh, the, the federal government will continue manipulating everything, so you shouldn't be in gold and silver. Or B, we're going to have Mad Max, so why have gold and silver? You should have guns, bullets, beans. And I don't think we're going to see those two. We, you know, I'm not saying we can't have the Mad Max, but we're not going to we're not going to have the manipulation forever. They can't do it because of the energy problem we're, we're discussed here. But the, the, uh, here's what's interesting: I tell people, what if you run out of bullets? What if you run out of food? All right, what are you going to use now to trade for more food? Ah, uh, then they, they, they kind of, ah, oh, you get that glance, you get that blank. Well, you, you built, you know, the guy who's selling bullets will probably take silver. What do you think uh, it would be an appropriate course of action for people today uh, if they accepted the, the, the premise that things are going to collapse? What sorts of things should people be doing today? Well, we moved out of the big city in 2007. And uh, my wife and I did, and I knew I knew what was coming. Been reading about it and saw it, and I wasn't surprised when we had the collapse, because you had Peter Schiff on CNBC for four or five years saying, you know, this this housing market, the whole the banking system, and sure enough, we we came on the verge of a collapse in 2008 and 9. Yep. Well, uh, everyone they, they propped it up, and I'm surprised how long it's been going on. But I would suggest, if people can. Uh, the, the, the small cities, the small towns, that's a good place to be if you can get out. If you can't, make, maybe just knowing someone, family, friends, get to know them. And if you, if you have to, you can go there if the dollar collapses. And then being in a big city is not a good place to be. I think the biggest cities will be the worst places to be. And this idea we're hearing about martial law, you know what? If I'm in the big city... I think I would want martial law because having people going out and just uh, tearing up the town isn't smart either. But I think people need to take control of their lives. Individual, they need to learn how to grow food. They need to know how to protect themselves. They need to be out of harm's way. And if you have extra funds, then it's wise to be in some physical gold and silver. But I think the most important thing is forget the system. Don't try to change it. You can't change a system that's going to fall apart. What you can do is change your reaction to that. And so the best thing to do is, is disassociate from it, remove yourself from it, and if you can get away from the biggest cities into a more uh, smaller uh, farm, farm environments, small towns, small cities, uh, I think that's the best way to go. 
Steve, I can't thank you enough. Uh, we've been talking with Steve Sangelo, who is the head of SRS Rocco Reports, and you can find him at srsrockoreport.com. It's an excellent website, highly regarded, and has some of the best information on the net that's available today. Steve, thank you very much. Thank you too. It's been a, it's been a pleasure chatting with you.